Hi everyone, I'm James, uh, the author of Monday Morning Haskell. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about TensorFlow, Haskell, and dependent types. So thank you very much for uh, coming to my talk. Don't have a whole lot of time in this talk, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of content to cover. So I'll be going pretty quickly and focusing mainly on the high level concepts. Um, but I promise at the end I will show you some resources where if you're more interested in this topic, you can uh, do some more in depth reading. Uh, so yeah, this we'll jump into it now and. So start with saying, okay, what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is an open source machine learning framework developed by Google. So it puts advanced machine learning techniques in the hands of ordinary developers like you and me. Um, and one thing that's really good is helping us separate the sort of algorithmic concerns of machine learning from the uh, hardware challenges that come with doing a lot of computation. Uh, so the fundamental unit of computation in TensorFlow is a tensor. And this is any kind of uh, numeric data that we can represent, whether that's just a single number or a vector of numbers or a matrix, or we can even go into more dim dimensions, have an array of matrices, matrix and matrices, whatever we want. And an important thing to know about tensors for the rest of this talk is that every tensor has a shape and a degree. So the shape is essentially a list of the dimensions of our tensor. So a single number is going to have an empty list as its shape. Uh, vector is just going to have a singleton list of the number of elements. Matrix will have uh, shape of length 2, and so on. And the degree is just the length of our shape. Uh, now, the way TensorFlow works <laughs> is that we create a graph of different computations in our machine learning system. And each different computation is a way of sort of, it takes some number of tensors as input and produces one or more tensors as its output. So examples of computations just be like adding two vectors together or performing matrix multiplication. And there's some more complicated uh, computations like 2D convolution, max pooling, and then learning algorithms like gradient descent. Uh, so there are three main ways that we describe tensors within TensorFlow. So there are constants where we just fill in the values that when we initialize and they hold these values for the entirety of our um, process. And then there are placeholders where we'll assign them a shape but no values. And on each iteration of our learning algorithm, we'll fill them in with different values. Uh, and then there's also variables. And variables are how we represent our model. These are tensors that we initialize, but certain learning operations like gradient set, for example, will change the values of our model as we start learning more and our model gets better. Um, but we won't deal with variables a whole lot in the rest of this presentation. Constants and placeholders will be our uh, focus. So Python is the most common language that people use for TensorFlow. It's the mm -hmm. most well-supported uh, library. Um, and as we know, Python is pretty prone to runtime errors. And a couple uh, examples of these that we'll go through include sort of dimensional mismatch between different operations and missing placeholder values. Uh, so to get a feel for what I mean by these errors, let's just look at a couple of very simple code examples. Here's uh, an example where we initialize it called constant tensors and then use the computation that we'll just add them together. And this is how we run this computation. We use something called a session and we call this session.run function and we just get our results. So this looks nice, uh, but then I suppose what happens we use a couple of constants that have different sizes. So we have a 1 by 2 constant and a 1 by 3 constant. We add them together and we get a runtime error. And that's not very fun. Um, this, these kinds of uh, mismatches can also happen with things like matrix multiplication or 2D convolution. So you have to make sure that your tensors would match up. Um, now if we look at the issue of placeholders, so here is generally we use something we can initialize uh, placeholders like so, and uh, we, do, we don't supply any values to begin with, but then when we actually run our session, we'll supply a dictionary that will fill in our two tensors M1 and M2 uh, with whatever values we want. And we run this and get our result. But the thing is, we can still call this run function on our computation without supplying any values. And when that happens, we'll get a runtime error because these placeholders don't know what their values are. Um, so, ideally, we, with a compiled language, we would be able to solve these kinds of problems at compile time. So, luckily, there is a uh, Haskell library for TensorFlow, largely, I think, thanks to Judah, and you work a lot on that. Um, and so, we have, you know, very basics of this library. We have 
um, the sensor type, which is parameterized by this BMSA type. We're not really going to focus on this B e type for the rest of this presentation, and the A is just sort of the type, numeric type that's going um, inside of our tensor like float or in 64 or whatever you want. Um, and then we have these are our basic initialization functions like the constant case A shape, which is just you know, our list of dimensions, and our little list of values that will go in the tensor. Uh, placeholder has to be a monadic function because it affects the state. Uh, tensor flows graph, uh, but then we, really the only input is our shape. We don't supply any values when we initialize the placeholder tensor. So here's how we might uh, do a very simple example. We'll use this one session to uh, run all this computation in the session on that, and we'll create a couple constant tensors and add them together. And that's very nice. And writing placeholder is actually a little more complicated. Uh, it's this sort of multi-step process. We have to take our vectors as inputs to a function, create our placeholder tensors, encode our input vectors as uh, to have the same shape as our tensors, and then we'll use this idea of a feed to uh, feed the inputs into our tensors. So here's sort of a very quick example. This is where we uh, use the monad to initialize our placeholders, give them the shape. Uh, these are our two vectors that are the inputs to our function. And then we need to encode uh, our vectors v1 and v2 down here. And again, we'll assign our shape. Then we create feeds, which will sort of form the connection uh, between our data and our tensors, m1 and m2. And then we'll call our sort of run step function. And this is how we run our placeholders. So we're using Haskell now. This is solved our problems, right? And well, let's find out what happens when we have these sort of incorrect uh, vectors that don't have the right dimensions. You know, this does not match the shape that we give it, and even if it did, uh, we'd be you know, adding these two together. And it turns out that this code actually still compiles, and this is still going to be a runtime error. <laughs> Unfortunately. And some other thing can happen with placeholders. We, can, you know, we have this run with feeds function, but we can just supply an empty list of feeds and not get our placeholder values, and it still compiles, and we'll get a runtime error. Uh, so, you know, that makes us a little bit sad. Uh, and it turns out in order to solve this problem, you have to use dependent types. So, start with the, the most basic example of a dependently typed sort of container would be the size and vector. So, uh, this is a vector where we uh, give the length of that vector at compile as part of its type. So, we have a vector 2 and 64 is something that contains exactly two uh, integers, vector 5 contains 5, and so on. Um, and so we can create something of uh, the size vector type using you know, a from list function, which returns a maybe value. So in these first two examples, we supply the correct uh, number of elements for our type, and so we'll get a just value out of this. And then down here, we don't supply the right number, so we'll actually get nothing, and this uh, operation ultimately uh, will fail. Uh, so we can use this idea to create something called a safe shape. So whereas the size of vector parameterizes by the by a single natural number, the number of elements in our vector, uh, we're going to parameterize our type by a list of natural numbers. And so this is, we're going to encode the shape of our tensor at the type level. And so we can use this, we can get a very similar uh, from shape function. And a very simple example. So we have uh, a two by two matrix. We make the shape for that matrix like so. Is this an apostrophe or a vector? Excuse me? Is this an apostrophe or a vector? Uh, apostrophe. And so one interesting thing we can do with this is we'll create something called a shape product. And this is going to help us tie the type level shape to the number of elements that should go into that shape. So for instance, if we have an empty list for our safe shape, then that only has one element, refers to a single number. Whereas if we have a non-empty list, then we'll use multiplication and a sort of recursively defined instance. So we'll use this on the next slide. So now, with these ideas, we can start creating our safe tensor type. And this is going to have an additional type parameter, which will be our type level list natural numbers, so that we're putting our shape, the shape of this tensor at the type level. And again, it's really going to take a normal tensor as an input, and it'll also have this additional shape parameter as output. So let's see how we do that. And we'll have this idea of a state constant function. So we'll feed in a size vector, so we know this has n elements. And we'll also supply it, whereas we were using a normal shape before, we'll now use a safe shape that's parameterized by S, 
and we'll get a safe tensor that has S as its type. And where we use our shape product is we'll add this extra constraint. So we'll say that the shape product of S, that is the number of elements that go into this uh, shape S, has to match N, the number of elements in our vector. This is pretty cool. And uh, here is some uh, a way we can use a code example here. So uh, we create a two by two safe shape, and then we create another uh, vector that has um, exactly four elements, and then we can use our safe constant function combine these, and we know that what we're getting out is a safe tensor that is that has a two by two shape. And so now, the various things that we do that are incorrect will give us compile time errors. Like for whatever reason, if we think. Uh, oh, this is only a vector of three elements. This is a compile error. If we say, oh, yes, the safe tensor I've made is actually a one by five tensor, when we use these elements, we'll get a compile time error. So that's very nice. And we can also create uh, what I call safer operations. So we can use the safe add function. And this takes in two tensors. And we now enforce that these tensors have the same shape. And then they produce another tensor that also has this shape. And matrix multiplication, you know, we'll take an i by n matrix, we'll multiply it by an n by o matrix, and as a result, we'll get an i by o matrix. Pretty cool. So now let's take this idea one step further and also encode the placeholder dependencies of our tensor at the type level. And so this slide looks very, very strange, uh, but really every placeholder essentially has a name and has a shape. So we're uh, also assigning a basically a dictionary mapping the names of our placeholders to the shape that they take. And so now all of our tensors know what placeholder values they depend on. So when we uh, initialize a placeholder, we'll assign a safe shape S, and we'll also, as part of its type signature, include its symbol. And then as a result, it'll be parameterized by a single list uh, right here that matches the symbol with this shape. And here's how we might do a safe add function. Here's what its type signature would look like. We have a certain set of placeholder dependencies, P1 for our first tensor, and then P2 for our second. And then the result of that is it'll have a union of these two sets of placeholder dependencies. And the one extra thing we want to add is instead of using a, just a normal list in our feeds, we can create a separate feed list type that will be parameterized by the same uh, sort of placeholder dictionary. So that way, when we run a safe tensor, we can ensure that we're supplying a feed list that has the same set of placeholder dependencies as our tensor. Um, and so here's a very quick example. And we can see that the code gets a little complicated, especially when we're, when we're trying to write down the type signature. So we have one placeholder that we'll say depends on A, which has to be a 2 by 2 matrix, and B. And then when we add them together, we get uh, that it depends on both of these. Is it possible to use like a type synonym to reduce the repetition? Yeah, I think so. Um, so at the end of all this, we can sort of ask, okay, was all this uh, song guys really worth it? And so there are some definite pros to this. Uh, we know more compile time behavior about our system, and we'll get fewer runtime crashes than we otherwise would. And also, I think it's a fair example that thinking back to this last, to the last thing we had, the types do provide a good amount of documentation for our code. So we can look at the sensor and say, okay, I know what uh, this depends on. But there are also some cons to this approach. It's dependent types, you'll inevitably get longer compile times. And it's also a very steep learning curve to uh, get into this topic. It would be basically impossible for Haskell to begin. You get us to really jump into your code base if you're doing this. Um, so that's basically all uh, concept for my talk. I do want to thank Formation once again for hosting Baypack. I want to thank all our organizers, Dan, Erica, um, Chris over there, Anthony, and Tigon. Um, thanks very much for all the words you put in. Um, I'm also going to do a little bit of some self plugs. I work for Cruise Automation. We're hiring. We don't use Haskell, unfortunately. It's very sad. Uh, but we do get to work on self driving cars. Uh, come talk to me if you're interested. Um, and then I'll also plug uh, my blog, Monday Morning Haskell. If you want to learn more about this topic, uh, I have a whole series that talks about Haskell and AI and dependent types. Uh, you want to go to mmhaskell.com slash Haskell AI. And you can also go to mmhaskell.com slash TensorFlow and download a guide that will help you install the Haskell TensorFlow library on your machine. Um, and that will also uh, subscribe you for our email list, which would be awesome. So that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Which GHC version does this like a little bit? I don't remember off the top of my head. I have to check. Um, I think after eight.
I just don't know more specifically this rule. So yeah, I worked on this a little while ago. Yeah, I have to check that out. Okay. How's it play with type inference? Type inference, um, it depends. Um, I think with the placeholders, I think like frequently you'll need to you'll need to explicitly state the type signature on placeholders just because otherwise you're because you're not supplying the name of it as an explicit um, type. And I think I, I, yeah, I think when you initialize things, you 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 will definitely need to use the type explicitly. But once you start performing operations on them, it'll be pretty good in terms after that. Would you not be able to work around that by saying like a safe placeholder and then requiring a name and then immediately discarding it once it's type is consumed? Like if you consume the string as a singleton type mm -hmm. the, and then throw it away? Possible. That would be very possible, yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't looked into it too deeply. But. What's the most complicated model that you tried to express? Oh, I haven't done anything that complicated. I haven't done anything where I'm in there like this, maybe a linear model. But I do know, I, I do know there's another library called Grenade uh, that I also write about in this series that does some pre. It mainly focuses on um, just sort of standard neural networks, but um, it does have a lot more sophisticated things with dependent types attached to it. So. If you're doing like offline learning and you're just like running a script and then like putting the values into something else, uh, so you're not like all the time running it, do you think that the benefits of outline safety are worth it? Um, I don't know. Like, honestly, like probably not, unless there, unless you know, I find a like cleaner way to sort of describe this library, or or alternatively, if we get to a point where dependent types are more well known, mm -hmm. or like you know. You can, you know, if they're popular enough that like beginners would be like, oh yeah, I know at least a little bit about dependent types, then I think that would make it more worth it. But at this point, I'd say like probably not because it's just there are so few Haskell, Haskell people anyways, and there's some excluding more by using sort of advanced concept. Yeah. Is, is this able to account for cancers whose size is only near the runtime? Is it again? Is this able to account for cancers whose size is only near the runtime? So you might have like, so, so you, you, might, you might know the length of the shape list, but you don't know the individual entries in the shape list. Until you, know the length. you might know the length of a shape list, but not know the entries. Yeah. So, so if, if you mm -hmm. had like, you know, a dynamically sized image, then you want oh, to yeah. build a model. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it would be, be pretty difficult for this to handle that, I, unless you have that sort of system where, like, you know the image is within, uh, has a certain max size, and you can sort of use that size as your tensor and just sort of have whatever workarounds um, you do to use when you have a smaller image within that. Um, but yeah, I feel like a true, a truly dynamic, dynamically sized input would definitely cause problems. With this. You already have some functions that work on tensors of polymorphic sizes like add or multiply mm -hmm. or, or so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with, with a, little, a little more work, it might be possible. But like, yeah, the, the like implementation, the implementations I did of safe add or were like not polymorphic, so, mm -hmm. so like, yeah, there are definitely difficulties that mm -hmm. um, you could probably do it, but. It would, yeah. Yeah, you probably need a little bit more of a dependent type and how that Haskell doesn't mm. really have to actually talk. Yeah. You need to talk about that dependent type of the dynamic thing you just loaded. Mm. So I think it, in Idris, you could probably do it quite well with Scala or something like that. We can get from Idris to Idris. So that you can get from Idris to Haskell at one time. You can't talk about it very much, though, right? You're known in your own map instance, it's a special case. It's mostly inconvenient as opposed to difficult. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Then that's time, everybody. All right. Thank you very much.